So have you been thinking about starting some vegetables this year? I know, on my channel we talk about houseplants, but today I actually want to talk about some of the vegetable growing. It's kind of like the middle towards the end of March now, and there's a lot of things that could be starting off if you want to have a bit of your own food crop this year. So if you're interested, keep watching and let's dive into some of the things I've learned, and also let's do some seeds starting together, shall we? Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to usually talk about my big passion, which you might be able to see behind me, it's tropical houseplants. Now my other big passion is what I'm going to be talking about in this video, which is kind of growing your own vegetables. For the people that have been here for a while, they know that I've got my own allotment here in the area that I live in the UK. For the people that are not from the UK and do not know what an allotment is, the simplest way that I can explain it, because I also come from a country where we don't have allotments, is that usually the, the local government of the area that you're living in basically might have a bit of land that they've purchased that might not be used for anything else, or it might be, like for instance where I am because it's a bit more agricultural, it's not the best quality agricultural land, so people can't necessarily use it to its best potential for growing commercially for vegetables, but it's still completely fine to grow vegetables for the average kind of homeowner or anybody else or any of the people that are in rental properties. I don't think you need to be a homeowner to have an allotment. And essentially they take one large plot, they subdivide it into smaller bits. So mine is 11 meters by 11 meters and you pay a yearly kind of rental fee. I think mine is as low as 20 pounds or 30 pounds a year. So it's not too, too bad. But, and then everybody has their own little plot and you can kind of talk to the neighbors and learn from each other. It's, it's more of a social thing than I ever thought it was gonna be, but it's been good so far basically. And uh, before we dive into the seeds, I know some people that are interested from seeing the allotment plot last year. Here's a little clip that I did yesterday at the plot. Okay, so this is the plot in the middle of March, actually. So you might be able to see, like, this is the fruit cage that is black currants. I always get them confused with black berries. Um, the two things that are planted out are black berries. Behind that is strawberries. Does there seem to be any life? Ooh, yes, there is. There seems to be life happening right there. And then if we move to this side, apologies for the rubbish, but we're clearing out the plot. These two beds are still to be done. That has just been composted because that is asparagus and this is the third year so I'm hoping there might be a harvest this year. This might look a bit barren right now but this is usually where the Jerusalem artichokes grow. So looking forward to those coming back this year. There's a bit of empty space behind them and the black currants were leaning over last year so there wasn't much space there but I think this year is probably going to have more black berries and also Logan berries. And here, there are some garlics uh, amongst the <laughs> uh, amongst the weeds, and then they also put in some carrots today. More garlic and onions. That will be the beans for the year. But this was from last year. There are some gooseberries here, and this is a very cool thing that is vining over here. Haven't had any fruits yet, but this is a kiwi eyesai, a sai, and it is, if you've never seen it, I'd definitely recommend you Google and have a look. It literally is small little kiwis, they grow like a bunch of grapes, and if I'm not mistaken, I think they are hairless as well, or you can just eat them whole, basically, which is really cool. Um, more gooseberries. You can see the polytunnel where a lot of love happens during most of the growing season. I'll take you to the back so you can see the backstage area. So there is right here where you might be able to see my welly. That is one of the raspberries. There's another one right there. Two compost bins, 
big water tank, including loads of other water tanks, because heat and not any running water in this plot specifically. So if I show you the rest of the bit that was done today, the brassica cage was cleared out, so there's loads of kale and a Brussels sprouts, and you can see the girls, basically, they are having an aneurysm. But let me show you the last bit. And then here you've got beetroot and fennel that has just gone in today. And for the people that are going to ask, <laughs> bunnies around the plot, so need to have chicken wire around it. Oh. Oh. And for the people asking, here are the girls. Uh, can you see Delilah, who is currently in malt and is looking a bit worse for wear? And Gracie Lou is fine. Both of these girls went broody over the winter. I thought I'd see if I could break Delilah, but it took three months. Uh, Gracie Lou took a few days. And then uh, Scrat, bless her, but Blanche, technically. <laughs> and they are very happy in their new chicken run. It's still got covering around it because it's still a bit wet and a bit cold. Probably in the next month or so that's going to be removed and they will see some uh, clear daylight again. But I mean, obviously it's quite bright in here. It's a cloudy day today, but you can see what everything is like. So obviously with that little clip, it's good to remember that it's still very early on in the growing season. Some things went in yesterday that you might have been able to see in the video. So I think beetroots went in yesterday, fennel went in yesterday, a lot of the brassicas, so Brussels sprouts and kale have gone in. Carrots went in yesterday, very, very small carrots. And also there's onions that went in a couple of weeks ago and garlic that has been growing since last autumn. But you could see some of the slightly more interesting variants of plants that I'm growing. So the kiwi isai or isai, which is a smaller little kiwi, check it out. The reason why I got it for the people that are wondering that live in the UK or a similar region of the world with similar weather where we can get relatively cold winters, that one is hardy down to, I think, minus 20 degrees Celsius. So, or minus 20 or 30 degrees Celsius. And I think natively is quite close to the Himalayas. So, yeah. Top tip, if you want to grow slightly more tropical feel plants, whether or not it's kind of in your garden as decorative plants or in um, a vegetable plot or an allotment or a vegetable section in your garden, check for plants that are from high elevations, high up in the mountains. And we've talked about this when it comes to our house plants as well, because those plants that are from higher elevations, a lot of the time, they tend to be quite hardy. So just bear that in mind. But yes, let me dive you down and we can chat as I am doing some seed starting today. So another glorious downwards angle for me. But let me talk to you what I'm going to be doing today, basically. So in front of me, you can see I've got a trough planter. By the way, these were a great deal, at least here on Amazon when I found them, because they're actually quite substantial. They're quite pretty looking. They've got some drainage holes that you need to kind of use a drill to kind of open up. But these, I think I got four for like 17 pounds. Please don't sell them all out at the same time. I need to get a few more, but very, very, very cool. And they are good quality as well. So top tip. Um, the other thing that you might be able to see that I've already kind of added into here is compost. And there are different layers to what I'm going to do, basically. So the compost that you're seeing at the moment, and this applies to a lot of your vegetable seed starting, regular compost can be very... Let me see if I can bring you an example so you can see it. So you might be able to notice there if it will focus. There's some sticks, there's some large elements, and generally with seeds, you don't want that because it can actually hamper those very tiny little roots that are happening from the seeds from being able to germinate and be happy within their growing media. So normally, I would not add kind of regular house, like garden compost 
and this by the way is peat free compost if you can buy peat free always have a preference towards peat free because let's all just give the peat bogs a bit of a break can we i think in the uk it's moving there everything will be peat f peat free i can use words i can on a sunday um this moving there kind of towards everything will just be that option soon basically so Having something like that, this is a specific compost that I got that is peat free that is meant for vegetable growing, but you don't have to, like you see, don't overcomplicate this. I always say this about houseplants, don't overcomplicate it. If it says it's for blooms, if it says it's for fruit trees, if it says it's for vegetables, if it says it's all purpose, much of a muchness generally, the bloom one might have certain things that are needed for the blooms as in like there might be some fertilizer pellets or something like that that might be more kind of prevalent to kind of helping things bloom but generally speaking most of them are fine i've i'm now growing some decorative uh plants for the garden that i've got from farmer gracie and i'm growing them in the same compost it'll be fine it's fine it's okay so yes put this as a layer and this is some seeds that i'm starting which can be done this way. I will show you some cells in just a moment. But, so the seeds that I'm gonna be starting today are, and these were actually from Lidl. So these are two different types of radishes. And why have I got two different types of radishes? So one of them, and I'm trying to remember which one it is. Do, 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 do. So this is just kind of a regular radish. This one is very early cultivation. And the reason why I'm using both, and if you can sometimes, this is quite a good little top tip, use a mixture of variety. It will help these you don't necessarily want to bloom because then it means that it's kind of bolting. And a lot of the times anything, when you hear the word bolting, so that, <laughs> let's do some education. So when you hear the word bolting, because I had to learn these things, when you hear the word bolting, it's not necessarily a good thing when it comes to vegetables. It means they are running towards blooms. And if you let them go towards blooms, um, a lot of the times, especially for some of the more root type vegetables like this, the roots will start going woody and they're not particularly edible really a large chunk of it won't be edible if you let it go for a long time it, most of it won't be edible so don't don't let it go to bolt if you can a lot of the times it's to do with temperature weather watering all these things i can do an entire video on bolting if you are interested this applies to anything i say in this video because i know that this is not my regular content but i also know again i did ask a lot of you on some of my other videos if you wanted to see this and you all said yes so hopefully this might be something of use to people basically. So yes, let me know if any of the topics that I talk about today, you want an entire video on them and I will more than happily do that. But yes, so I'm using both. Can you guess why? Because essentially what I'm gonna do is hedge my bets with this and just kind of go, okay, do an early variety and do a later variety, which means that the early variety I'll be able to harvest a lot earlier and the later variety. So it will always have some interest. And with most seeds, especially fast seeds, the reason why I'm growing radishes is because radishes prefer it to be slightly cooler. So this is the perfect time for radishes. Um, and they are, they can grow quite fast. Sometimes radishes can go from seed to harvest in three to four weeks, which might seem like a long period of time for people that are not patients, but for vegetables, that is very, very fast. So I'm doing both. And where is it? the other little seed packet that I have from last year is a pak choy. And I, I think I got this on Amazon. This works quite well. Now, bit of a backstory on the pak choy. I bought the pak choy, I had it in cells. Hopefully I'll find a little video and put it here because I've got a little polytunnel that I've installed this year at my garden, not the allotment. There's a bigger polytunnel at the allotment, but there's one at the garden now. And um, they pretty much, they didn't bolt, but the, they, the seedlings were stretching basically. I did not catch them early enough. And when you get stretching on seedlings, they get very leggy, that's another word. So think about it the same way that we would do for houseplants when you think about etiolation or where things stretch towards the light. Seedlings, it's not a good thing when they start stretching because if you'd imagine something's got a very thin uh, kind of growing stem and the cotyledons, so it's another little scientific word there. So these are the first two leaves 
that will come up on any seed that you're growing, whether or not it's house plants, whether or not it is kind of vegetable plants. The cotyledons are not what is called a true leaf. They are the first leaves that emerge. And a lot of the times when you're talking about things like vegetables, people will be like, you need to wait for to do this or to do that until at least you've got the first set of true leaves or at least you've got five to ten true leaves and then you can kind of do things. So a cotyledon stage, they are still very, very sensitive. And if they've stretched like this and you've got the little two cotyledon leaves at the top and then you'd imagine with something like a bok choy that it's very heavy, big leaves, that won't be able to support it. So not a good thing so i will be restarting them now i don't know why for some reason i wanted to start them on a cell and i even had the insane moment of having them on a heat mat with other things which i'll show you in just a moment but they don't need a heat mat <laughs> they don't need a heat mat they're, they're they their plants that generally do well at this types of temperatures that we've got now in march in the uk so they are going in here as well but yes so back to the soil so this is the compost but what i will do and this is the extra bit is right next to me i got a bucket and this bucket has got essentially what is coco coir and vermiculite and the coco coir and vermiculite is what i would use in my seed starting cells now why am i doing both so you know how we all use coco coir for our house plants part of the reason is because coco coir a lot of the times can be quite finely ground and a lot of the times it can also be what is known as an inert material to a certain point because it doesn't have very much or any nutrition to it for the plants. So it works really well for house plants because you're not introducing like pathogens and things like that. But guess what? Your seedlings can be very sensitive to the same type of things. So it's always a good idea when you're starting your seeds and you can get seed uh, starting mixes from the stores and the shops but you don't necessarily always have to do this use what you've got we've got enough things for our repottings that a lot of it can just be reused especially if you're thinking about starting with vegetables anytime soon and i know there's a lot of you out there that already do vegetables so you know this already like there's no point of buying more and more things we've got enough things when it comes to us growing our house plants so use what you got basically now the other thing that i've added in here is vermiculite and why because vermiculite will make it a bit more airy your seedlings still need a bit of air do not if you can use perlite or if you're going to use perlite use a fine grain perlite because the seedlings haven't got strong enough roots and the perlite might cause the same issue that you might be getting with like the sticks and stones that i was talking about before in the regular compost so that is something to kind of bear in mind vermiculite is a much finer grain and it helps a bit with that moisture retention as well which again you want now what you might have been able to see before is the compost was relatively dry it is slightly damp but not massively so however the coco coir and the vermiculite i had pre-soaked because i got one of the coco coir bricks so this is just the right level of kind of moisture to it which is perfect for seedlings. What you don't want to be doing after you put your seedlings in is watering and everything floods because you know, as well as I do, that if you try to water a dry growing media, everything pools. And some of these seeds are absolutely ditchy tiny, so bear that in mind. But yes, as I was talking about before, the two radishes are going to go in interspersed with some bok choy. So this is another big tip if you've got low space, and this is why I'm showing you in a planter, is interplant basically find things there are loads of websites that talk about companion planting again i can do another video on that if you want but there are loads of things that will quite happily grow together and i'll give you an example so for instance something like a bok choy and a radish both tend to be relatively fast growers but the radish is even faster than the bok choy so it means that it will be out and big whilst the bok choy is still growing 
which means it won't then shade the bok choy further down the line because you've already harvested the radishes and what's left is the bok choy that might be ready to harvest in a couple of weeks. So it kind of gives you a continuous stream. The other thing that you might want to do is consecutive planting. So you've got things growing, sprinkle some more seeds of the same thing, and then you've got another flush of vegetables coming further down the line. Something as small as this can be exceptionally productive. Like I'm thinking about people that maybe only have a balcony or anything like that. Could be exceptionally productive. Another little top tip. If you live anywhere that's like an apartment and you don't even have a balcony and you still want to do something like this, go for easy vegetables, something like radishes, bok choys, things like that. And if you've got a semi-decent grow light, that might be all that you need. The temperature is fine, remember how to water it, and you could still potentially have your own little harvest of vegetables in your house, inside your house as well. So that's another big thing that you could do. So let's do the seeds now, shall we? So let's start off, and I'll show you what I do to finish off the seeds. Let's start off with the bok choy. So the bok choy can be quite, quite small seeds if I'm not mistaken. So let me see if I can show you a couple of the seeds. So it might not even come up on the camera. Can you see how titchy tiny that is? You are looking at kind of like poppy seeds size. So a lot of the times what I will do is I'll just sprinkle and then thin out basically because otherwise you go insane trying to do them one at a time. And I have just sprinkled them at the top of the soil level and people will be like, aren't you supposed to be burying them? Yes. And the thing that you need to know about seeds is you bury them as deep as the seed size is. So these were tiny. You'd probably only need to go a titch down and then put some soil over but sometimes it can get a bit heavy and all of these things. But if you think about something like a sunflower seed, for instance, which is quite large, you can go a lot deeper than that. So if you think how big a sunflower seed is, go that deep and then cover it up. It's very simple. People like to overcomplicate it for no good reason, basically. So let's have a look at this. The other thing that I will tell you that I've learned <laughs> over the like periods of growing seeds is Make sure when you're opening the packets, a lot of the times, very usefully, <laughs> and not at all annoyingly, the date that the seeds expire is usually where you're gonna try and open. So try to keep the date on there, trust me, because if you like something and you wanna plant it again the following year, you kinda wanna know if it's viable still. So this is some of the radish seeds. And you can see these are still small, but they are larger than the pak choy seeds and yes i could have done channels and done it that way but i live on the dangerous side i always say it's always a good thing so i am just going to sprinkle a bit like that i'm kind of seeing that there's a few dropping here and there that's all that i need from this one now let's put the other radish seeds in shall we Any difference in size? No, the seeds are exactly the same size. And then what I'll do is I will just go like this. And don't get me wrong, I am probably gonna need to thin this out because there are a lot of seeds in here at the moment, but I'm okay to do that, it's fine. A lot of the times when you're thinning things out, especially if you're planting directly into either the container that they're gonna grow for the rest of their lives in, or even in the soil, sometimes when you are like picking out the weaker seedlings, a lot of the times, not everything, but they are technically microgreens. So if you've got enough of them, you've got enough microgreens as well. So free food, even at that early stage, you don't have to kind of get rid of it. You don't even have to eat it or get rid of it. You could pluck out the ones that are less kind of strong or a bit weaker and maybe put them up into their own little cells or plant them somewhere else or give them to somebody else. There's still seedlings that have got the potential to grow into whatever vegetable that is that you're growing, but they'll just take a bit longer basically. So all the seeds are in now. Now for the last bit. And this might be the bit that surprises people. And I cannot remember, oh, I can't remember the channel. I will put it at the top. Love, love, love this YouTuber, not just for houseplanty content, but soil science content. 
and I think she's based in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And I love this time of the year because she always goes on about um, kind of seed starting and vegetables. And I'm just like, oh, I learned so much from her and other places as well. But oh, she's fantastic. Um, and one of the things that she was saying is a lot of the times with vermiculite, if you've got seeds that are tiny, you can either grow them, and I will echo this, you can grow them directly in vermiculite, or you kind of place some vermiculite on top of your seeds. And I've found when I've done this with a lot of my planting recently, oh, it has worked a charm. Now you've got the vermiculite at the top there. You don't even need to flatten it. I'm just being a bit extra for some bizarre reason at the moment. But what I would want to do with this now, because remember the cocoa coir was kind of moist. What I want to do is I want to make sure that there's some moisture on top of the vermiculite because that acts as a bit of a moisture blanket on top of the seeds. So what you want to do, what I do at least, is I just go in with, you might get some kind of flying particles around. Should I be wearing a mask? Yes. <laughs> Should you be wearing a mask? Probably. But do as I say, not what I do basically. Um, and I will just spray this with, um, and you can see already even with a vermiculite how much is flying around. If I was to do this with the seeds, those seeds might be flying around as well. So I just want to make sure that it is getting a nice and damp on the top so that they've got that moisture blanket on top of them. And essentially at this point, you are done. This will go and live in my little polytunnel that I was talking about before in my garden. But before that, crucial, crucial part, and trust me for somebody who has zero patience and is not very, very organized, <laughs> plant labels. If you take nothing else away from this specific video, plant labels, do plant labels, trust me, because I was up there with the rest of them going, of course I'm going to remember what I've put in there. <laughs> 70 plants later, you're just sitting there going four months later when things have started to come up or like they're kind of not ready for harvest yet and you're just sitting there going, because I'll tell you a little secret, a lot of the seedlings look identical. So uh, label, just get some labels. You don't even need to get some labels. You can reuse things from around the house. You can reuse labels when you've done orders from house plants, the back bit, usually you can write somewhere, but labels, write down what it is and put it on and thank me later because oh, learned the hard way Le learned the stubborn way because i am a stubborn taurus but yeah like oh, labels so let me just quickly write these up so yes labels trust me oh my god um and before anybody asks is why am I growing that many radishes, um, I do this thing where I make myself soups at the beginning of the week, usually for my lunches whilst I'm working and I've got an instant pot and I do this kind of weird, what I like to call my, my Japanese inspired soup with like potatoes and radishes. It's supposed to be daikon radishes and I have tried to grow daikon radishes two years in a row and I have failed every time. So if anybody out there knows how to grow daikon radishes successfully, please let me know because, <laughs> but yes, I just put regular radishes in, some kind of potatoes as I said, some mushrooms, uh, some miso paste. Oh, it becomes some wakame seaweed afterwards as well. Beautiful, beautiful soup. But use a lot of radishes especially around this time of the year so uh, that be why I've done this. So let me put this down let me show you some of the seeds that I've started and then I can wrap up and kind of give you some final thoughts basically. Okay so I've got the tray in front of me of things that I started in cells and on a heat mat as well so that's another thing to kind of remember with these specific plants because they need that heat a bit earlier on and the growing season in the UK isn't very long so you want to have a bit of a heads up. If you are fortunate and you live in a warm country you probably don't need to do this you can probably start them straight in the ground but over here can you guess what I'm going to be showing you for the people that might be in the know? So tomatoes and peppers. So let me give you uh, an indication. So 
These are some of the first peppers that kind of grew out. And these I've labeled as snack peppers. So they're little kind of bell peppery type things. Can you see the cotyledons that have got slightly dark kind of speckling on them? That I think is because the light was too, too bright. But you can see in between those cotyledons, you can see some other greener leaves coming through. Those are the first set of true, true leaves. So generally speaking, Anything that's the first two leaves that come out, those will be the cotyledons. The leaves immediately after those first two leaves tend to be the true leaves. So I'll give you another example here. So this is not vegetables. This is going to be something that's going to be decorative for the garden. And this wasn't grown, was it? Uh, no, it was. It was on a heat mat. These are coleus seeds. And they look a bit different. You can see how low to the actual ground they were because they were getting a lot of like light straight away. And these here are my tomatoes. And I tend to go for a bush variety, not a bush variety, trailing variety. And they are called Red Alert. And you can see, some of you might be sitting there going, but that looks a bit leggy. Now, this is the interesting thing. So a lot of the plants, you don't want them to be leggy. So this is an example of some um what are they called they are i've got it here as well french dwarf double marigold so these are just some marigold seedlings and they are starting to get you can can you see that one that just dropped that's the problem with leggy seedlings they will drop and a lot of people might look at these and just go they're a bit too leggy and yes i might need to restart these and the problem that i had with those is they sprouted, but I didn't get light on top of them fast enough. And let me give you another kind of little thing. I've got a very strong grow light, one of those panel grow lights over these. They are literally there. That's how high the grow light is in relation to where the leaves are. And yes, mine has got the kind of dimming option, but even with the dimming option at that height, it's still on 60 or 70% of light strength. It's insane. These are getting about five to six thousand foot candles at like leaf level, which remember the peppers that I just showed you that were a bit darker around the sides? Potentially, and I've been trying to figure this out, if anybody knows, let me know. Potentially the blackness that you're seeing on the cotyledons is because the light above it was too bright. However, a few things that I'm doing with these. There is an oscillating fan that goes very, very gentle breeze. And why? I will tell you why. Because can you see the stems of these tomato plants? So they are very, very thick stems. It might not look like it, but I have grown these in previous years where I didn't have a grow light quite so close to them or even a fan going, and they were nowhere near that thick. Now, with peppers, I think you can do this with peppers as well. I'm looking at it now, yes. And with tomatoes, because they are both part of the nightshade family, they have slight fuzziness on their kind of stems. You kind of almost want your tomato plants, possibly your pepper plants as well, it's, it's been done with tomato plants for years, um, to have a bit of legginess to them. As long as they're strong, then you're fine. Because what you do is when you bury these into the ground later on, when you put them out, you put them all the way. So if you see these little seedlings here, I would put them, all of this would be buried in the ground and just leave the top bits exposed. These are nowhere near ready to go in just yet, but say they were. And what will happen with these types of plants, so the tomatoes and the peppers, can you see the fuzziness, is that that stem can then start growing roots. Off the stem. Now, with something like your marigolds or even the bak choy that I had that was kind of bolting, you can't do that. It won't grow roots, you won't get any benefit from it, and then you'll get them flopping down. Because you can understand if that is so, so weak, then when you start getting heavier leaves and things like that on it, it won't do well. So try to give them as much light as possible. If you are growing plants, unless the seeds specifically say, it needs light to germinate, then you don't need to give it light. It might need heat to germinate. Heat mats are a good idea. If you don't have a heat mat, 
you can put them, I think I heard somebody say, on top of an, um, not an oven, <laughs> no, not an oven, on top of your fridge, because the fridge, usually the top area there, it can get quite warm. So just keep an eye that it doesn't dry out too much as other things that you need to consider. But with plants, as soon as you see germination, and this is the bit that was never clear when I was looking at it as well, because I'm sitting there going, oh, I'm waiting for all of these to germinate, and then as soon as they all germinate, I'll put them underneath the light. No, 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 no. The moment that you see the first seedling come up and has germinated, this entire thing needs to come off the heat and directly underneath some very, very bright light. Because a couple of things that need to happen there. What bright light you might have, even with very strong grow lights, is never gonna be as bright as it is in the garden. Which you might have heard an expression from people talking about hardening off seedlings. So when you've got them to the stage, like, and again, I'll bring up the tomato plants and you can see these have got more of their kind of true leaves coming through now. If I was to take these out, even if the weather was a bit warmer than it is now, and pop them in the ground, which is what I've done the last two years, and I keep kicking myself because I have never kind of acclimated them to the outside temperatures, they get knocked back almost down to like a seedling level again, and I lose all of that time that I've gained by growing these inside, because that's supposed to be an early variety, but for me it never has been because I, dum dum over here, will take them out without hardening them off. What does hardening off mean? Hardening off just literally means wherever you've got them, say you've got them in the house, you take them outside. Usually you need to build up to this. You take them outside for, say the first day, somewhere where there's a lot of shade, because even with a lot of shade, we've talked about this with house plants, that's still brighter than it would ever be in your house. So a week there, maybe only half a day, you take them out when it's, sunny but shaded and bring them in before it gets cold in the evening. Never leave them out overnight when it's cold because they need to build up a tolerance to that as well. And then start leaving them out for a bit longer. But most of the times to the point where you can get them to that they're out the full day and then maybe start saying, okay, they've been out for a full day for a few days. Can they stay out the night as well? Because the night obviously is when the temperatures drop what you are basically doing to those plants is getting them used to wind, which is why it's a good idea with most of your seedlings if you can have a tiny bit of a breeze going with them because it helps them strengthen up and it helps them get used to the higher light levels and the colder evenings. Because a lot of the times these plants do not have kind of the protection that they need from the cold. They build that up slowly when they're outside in the wild, so to speak. So it's always a good idea to harden off your plants and that's how you harden off. Slow exposure and I know it might seem like a lot but at the end of the day if you've got five or six trays like this or one tray like this all you need to do is just take it out at the same time and just bring it in. It might be as simple as before I go to work in the morning take it out, take it back in when I've got back from work. It's as simple as that. You don't need to overcomplicate it, trust me. The whole point is you're not leaving them out permanently off the bat. Do it gradually, however gradually you feel comfortable with, and you should be fine, basically. But it's all kind of learning and growing, and a lot of this stuff might seem entirely obvious because a lot of kind of the principles behind this is stuff that we do with our houseplants anyway. So, yeah. But yes, I have prattled on for way too long. Can you tell I can talk about seedlings and planting out and my vegetables and do all the cows come home? I love it. Um, but yeah, hopefully you've appreciated this. If you've got any questions, do let me know. I've been growing at the allotment now coming up to three years. And I'm doing it from the point of, I've never really grown vegetables, but I grow loads of houseplants all the time. How hard could it be? Um, and yeah, we can take it from there. And if you want my next video, I can show you some of my more tropical varieties. So you saw that kind of more tropical kiwi plant that I've got at the allotment, but I'm not only growing some things there that are more on the tropical side, but also starting off some in here at the moment. They have just started sprouting. So if you want that video, let me know and I can show you the more kind of tropical variety of fruits and veg that you could grow even in countries like the UK. It's just having know-how or knowing what specific species of plant to purchase. But yes, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.